Welcome to the Brian Rue Show. Today is October the 14th, 2016. I'm with Frank Raymond for the second time on the show. And uh, he's author, author of the book Sweet Dreams and Terracells, which is really concerned about the future of European civilization and, uh, and the white man. Today he's going to talk about the Trump phenomenon and how it's, uh, its effect on, the, on, on European peoples. And he's deeply concerned about this. So, Frank... Tell us uh, what you have in mind. Well, what I have in mind is that um, I wrote this book, Sweet Dreams and Terror Cells, largely out of concern that European humanity was under great threat. It is being steadily diminishing as a, in absolute numbers, as a proportion of the world, of the world population. It's under constant attack. Indeed, in uh, one or two generations, there may be no white people left, or there will be so few as to be ineffective on human matters. Uh, it's a terrible development, and it's uh, being driven by very evil people. Evil persons are driving this. And um, we now stand at a historic watershed. People seem to think of this coming election in the United States this election that's going to happen on the 8th of November, only three weeks from now, some people seem to think that it's just another election. It'll be a Democrat take or a Republican uh, contest between two parties. It is far more than that. Yeah. This is not any old election. It's a moment of decision. It's a watershed uh, event. And uh, there is only one thing standing between a police state, between open borders, a totally flooded and colonized United States. Uh, and that thing is this improbable man, this improbable hero known as Donald Trump. Um, this person regarded as coarse, as uh, blunt, as a kind of satrap who has been making money all his life. Yet this unlikely man is possibly the one thing now that stands between total, uh, a rapid slide downwards and the death of the white race in America, and therefore throughout the world, um, and also with it a police state for all the peoples in the United States and all over the Western world. Uh, we are looking at um, a moment in which possibly the slide downwards, the forward march of the masters of the new world order can be slowed and slowed significantly so that people have a breathing space, uh, a chance in which to gather their energies and strike out for their freedom, for their, um, uh, for their lands, for their forests, for their green spaces, for uh, the soul of their people. And uh, above all, moment in which they can get that precious uh, momentum which will slow down the uh, on the almost irresistible march of the new world order yeah. Yeah. well said yeah. well let's put it this way humanity is in danger the entire planet is reproducing we now have seven billion souls on this tiny planet they are gorging themselves, they have to, 7 billion people. They have to eat, they have to live, they have to chop down trees for fuel, for furniture, they have to rob the oceans, they have to strip the rivers of their fish. And everywhere pollution is, uh, uh, pollution is a serious um, danger to the ecosystem. We have contamination of the rivers and the oceans. Humanity is on a downward path to the end of life and certainly before that to a very miserable state of life. People in the West have no idea what it's like in the slums and shanty towns of Africa and Asia. Right. And they have no idea that that is the life that is coming to them as well. It's bad enough that uh, two-thirds of humanity lives in such conditions and is killing off every animal and plant in those areas, but that life is coming to the West. These lands which were formerly spacious, where there were 
a relatively low number of people per square mile are now being flooded, flooded by design. Um, and that's why I wrote Sweet Dreams and Terror Cells, to wake people up yeah. to this um, phenomenon that is being driven so ruthlessly, that is being pursued so relentlessly by those that I call the sneak rulers. Mm -hmm. Some people call them the globalists. Some people call them the masters of the new world order. I wrote the book to wake up people to this terrible progress towards a hellhole and uh, show them what they're losing. I also wanted to tell them that like every other people, white people have a soul, they have a spirituality and it, the world would be a poor, poorer place if that were lost. And uh, I'm afraid to say that uh, we don't have endless time. We may have only three weeks left before a a final twist in the road comes, after which there'll be no turning back. If Hillary Clinton and the Democrats win this election, she has pledged, she's pledged, and secretly wants a state in which she said, open trade and open borders. And she said it for the entire hemisphere, oh, yeah. for the entire Western hemisphere. Well, that would mean over a billion people, well, I may be wrong about the numbers, but certainly more than 600 million people from places like uh, Belize, Belize, I don't know how they pronounce it, Belize, Guatemala, and Uruguay would be flooding into the U.S. absolutely freely because this is what we call open borders. And it is now a fact, a proven fact, that Hillary Clinton is pledged to this. And she pledged it of all people to a group that is central to the New World Order, the bankers, the yeah. international bankers. Yeah. There will be no, it will be very difficult once you pass that bend in the road to ever recover your freedoms, to ever have any land left for yourselves. And it is clear that Donald Trump knows that from his pronouncements, he is now clearly identifying this New World Order and the people behind it, or some of the people behind it, and saying, I will stand up to it. I will protect you from this invasion and colonization. And from mm -hmm. the people, and I know who the people are behind it. So we have a decision point. And I have to say that I prefer the, um, whatever his warts and problems are, I prefer Donald Trump because there is a world view there. It's a world view in which the European peoples, the white peoples, will have spaces of their own, lands of their own, yeah. which are still not overpopulated hell holes, which still try to preserve trees, forests, clean air, clean water, animals. And if they do, these forests, these green spaces will provide the oxygen for an earth that is now under grave threat an ecosystem under grave threat and will provide an example how life should be lived. People have forgotten in large parts of the world what life was and how it should be lived. There are people who are born in slums yeah. who know nothing but somehow scrabbling to find material things who have, who have come to accept that this is the way it's going to be. We're going to live in tiny little uh, cells like bees in a hive we're going to have disgusting slums. We're going to think only about gathering food and cultivate, cultivate, cultivate every inch of soil. They think that's the norm. Yeah. Only if the Western world keeps itself Western and keeps itself with a low population, and if the white race, with its natural, with its strong affinity for nature preservation, um, of the um, bio system, only if they survive will the planet survive. The, some time ago I was in Seattle and I happened to stop in at a coffee shop and I saw some people, about seven or eight of them, sitting together having coffee and chatting. Uh, they had their laptops and they were speaking about, this man was speaking about the methane belt that is around the, main, around the earth but mainly around the equator.
the methane belt is thickest and most dense uh, in a ring around the equator. And uh, he was talking about how the future of humanity was certain to be arrested, uh, mm -hmm. terminated if this continued. And he said it's strongest uh, wherever there's a thicker, more population, because mm -hmm. they're producing all the um, oh, and the uh, the particles, the carbon uh, carbon uh, compounds that make up methane. Yeah. Now. Uh, he was very concerned about it, and about the future of the planet, of humanity, of what would happen to the, to the living creatures of the earth. You will not see anyone in China, or Japan, or India, or Indonesia having this kind of concern, looking forward to the future. Uh, we need Europe, the European peoples, the European races, to survive so that the planet can survive. Uh, it's an unfortunate fact. But European peoples to survive need a country. Yeah. Now, the question is, of course, what is a country? Well, we know what it used to be. A country, as we used to know it, was a race wedded to a land. Yeah. Now, that race might be a blood blend, as, say, the, the um, British are a blood blend of various sub-races, but all allied, all parts of the North European family. Um, but it is a racial group that is wedded to a land. So when people said England, they meant the English race living on English land. Yeah. Now, here's a group of people who have a country. What is a country? It's a piece of land, a parcel of land that you can call your own. That you know that when you're born, you will have this land to cultivate, to grow the food you need, to provide the water that you need to survive to provide a space for a home. Today that is all gone. Now they say, oh gee, that would be racist to think that. We've got to open the borders. Yeah, We've racist. got to have multiculturalism. We've got to have diversity. diversity. And guess what? You don't have a piece of land to call your own. You're born in a crowded little place with no room for a farm because 50 million people from Africa and yeah. Latin America are there. You are not born with a guarantee of a home. That's the point. Yeah. You are b born homeless. Um, that is the way it has always been, and that is the way it is in most of the world today. A Japanese person mm -hmm. is born in knowing that there's a parcel of land there for him and his folk, people of his kind, with his mind, mm -hmm. his soul, his outlook, and he can have a bit of it there will be that land to provide corn and wheat for him and his children. Today an American has to worry about that fact. He'll say, gee, I don't think my children are going to have any land because you know what? We're going to have 50 million Latinos and 20 million Eritre Eritreans coming in. We can't afford it. Yeah, yeah there just won't be any left. Yeah. There's fertile soil is at a premium. So that is a country. Um, Basically, a country is a piece of land that you can call your own, a with a guarantee of life, with food and water, and a community of your own, people of your own kind, people with your own soul, people with your own outlook, folk soul, people, the folk soul, yeah. people that you can communicate with and be fr be comfortable among. Yeah. Well, if aliens keep pouring in, you don't have a country. Yes. Sure. And that is what Donald Trump says over and over. A country without borders is not a country. Yeah. And that's the traditional definition of a country, not today's what, what the liberals call the modern multicultural state. Yeah. That's not a country. It's not a home. It's a hotel. Like Canada. Yeah. yeah. A country without borders is not a country. And the other thing Donald Trump keeps saying is either we have a country or we don't. Now, Donald Trump is speaking to two audiences. Yeah. He's speaking, one, to his nation. By nation, I don't mean the state. By nation, I mean something derived from the Latin word natus, meaning birth. Oh. A nation is a group of people of the same race with the same ancestors, the same ancestral base. Yeah. But he's speaking to his nation. He's speaking to the European Americans. But he's also speaking to present Americans. He's speaking to all who are today within the borders of America. 
and that includes black people, that includes Latinos. He's saying present Americans are going to get the shaft if more millions keep pouring in. So if you black, now that would appeal to a black person. A black person has a home in Alabama, yeah. in Georgia, say, and then he sees Hillary's open borders and he sees a hundred million Latinos pouring into yeah. Alabama and yeah. Georgia. Yeah. He doesn't have a, have a home. So he's okay with Donald Trump's state protection, yeah. the state patriotism. It may not be a national patriotism, but it's state patriotism. Even the Latinos who are in America, who are in the United States today, know very well that if any more millions of Latinos come in, the good life they've found there yeah. is going to vanish. Be diluted <laughs> by more of them. They'll, they'll descend to the poverty that they've been escaping from. Yeah. And of course, if, uh, if America becomes a Latino state, there'll be all the corruption, all the violence, all the lack of civic sense that you find that they have, that they find in their countries and they lose the safety that they have in America, yeah. the sense of going to a government office and saying, thinking that they'll treat me fairly. Yeah. I don't have to pay a bribe. Yeah. So yeah. Donald Trump is speaking to two audiences. One, to the white people who have been so thoroughly dispossessed and turned into strangers in their own land. But he's also saying, let's look at the Americans, present Americans, those right now in America, citizens. Yeah. Let us keep what we have and not let this country be flooded yeah. and faded any further. So, now, here's the thing. That white people do not have a country anywhere. Not in Sweden, yeah. not in Germany, not in Australia. Certainly so not England. You keep Certainly not England. You live you talk there, about right? the Yes. You talk about the importance of a country, but they don't have a country. And the question is why? The Japanese have it, and the Chinese have it. Why don't white people have a country? Why are they told that it would be criminal to have one? The words for criminal are simple. Racist! Yeah. Xenophobic! <laughs> yeah. Okay? So, on the other side of this vision of people having a country, a land of their own, that, that will provide for them and they can confidently, they are confident, will provide for their children. On the other side of that is the New World Order. Yeah. The New World Order and the people who command it, the sneak rulers, have a different vision. They want to destroy all the nation states. Well, they've done so. Britain is not a nation state yeah. anymore. There's no nation. Britain is full of Jamaicans and Pakistanis. Yeah. The Indeed. British nation that had been formed from the blood blend of the of the Scots, Irish, English, and Welsh is gone. It's diluted. Yeah. There is no Swedish nation. Yeah. But the sneak rulers have their ideas. They want to. De they've already destroyed the nation states. Now they'll destroy the state itself. Uh. They'll remove all these borders, and they will rule over what was formerly the white world, from Australia to New Zealand to Canada. Yeah to the United States, to Europe, it'll, they'll reduce it to one borderless unit. Yeah. And in this borderless unit, they will replace, and which they're already successfully doing, replace the original people, the founding peoples of the civilizations and lands, yeah. uh, the whites, they'll replace them with black and brown mass, and then they want them mongrelized. So yeah. there'll be no identity even among those people. Let yeah. the... Um, a Vietnamese person marry an African, let the Vietnamese woman marry an African man. Once they're mongrelized, they have no sense of identity, roots, heritage, none of the things that give a person pride, identity, and support. Easier to control then. Easier to control. So the super state, as you're seeing, is being done by unending floods of immigrants, refugees, whatever you want to call them, but they're invaders and colonizers. It's incremental. Enabled it? from within. Yeah. And by these organizations that are breaking down straight boundaries. Yeah. NAFTA, this so-called Trans-Pacific Partnership, the European Union. Oh, yeah. 
So, you know, now it would be an interesting one day to talk about why the snake rulers want this. Yeah. Well, very briefly, it makes vast profits for them. Hmm. They want to rule the entire white world, but they want to also trade with the whole world. Yeah. And um, they would like the whole world to be a free trade zone. And then there'd be no patchwork, self-reinforcing patchwork economies. Ah. Um, you could, they would turn the whole of, say, Kansas into a wheat field and say, well, we're getting economies of size, economies of scale. Um, they say the whole of America and Canada should be deindustrialized because you know what, these countries are better off just being peasants producing wheat and corn and rice. Uh, the Chinese can um, make the computers and we make bigger profits that way. Let the computers that are pouring into Walmart, the electronics, the microwaves, all be made in China. Uh, economies of scale and we get a profit out of each unit, so if there's a billion units being shipped, so much the better. Yeah. And if ocean-going tankers and cargo ships plow up the oceans, killing the fish, burning the burning precious fuel, polluting the air, who they don't give a damn. They're getting profits, profits, yeah. profits. So that's on a topic for another day. But you'll yeah. notice that under the New World Order, what we have is uh, economies of scale with large volumes and large units yeah, yeah. and uh, America, America has been deindustrialized for that. Yeah. It doesn't help Americans, it certainly doesn't help Canadians. Yeah. You know what? Canadians today don't produce their own clothes, they don't produce their own cars, they don't produce their own computers. That's How crazy. do they pay for it? Yeah. They pay for it by raising and mowing down their forests and sending the timber to China. They pay for it by selling their fish. They, now they are talking about denuding the Alberta oil sands and making a pipelines to ship it all to China. In effect, they are produced an economy in which, for their profit, you will not produce your own stuff. Other people will labor instead of you, yeah. and you will pay for their labor. You will pay the Chinese and the Japanese and the Koreans. Yeah. You will pay for that labor by losing your patrimony. Wow. Forever, your forests, oh, your oil. Because the sneak rulers don't think too far ahead. They think only three generations ahead, maybe. Yeah. It's immediate money that interests them, and immediate rule yeah. to dominate, to rule. And so, um, of course, you know, I understand that people often talk about economies of scale and specialization. Well, in the village, if you're talking about one village that works, it is not worth it for one man to make his own shoes, to be a carpenter, yeah. and also to be a hunter and a, and a cattle raiser. Yeah. So they have one man to be a hunter, one man to be a cattle breeder, another man to be the shoemaker. Yeah. It works in a village. It certainly doesn't work for whole countries and whole continents. Um, it certainly doesn't work when these countries are so different. How can you stop about free trade and say compete when the Chinese have their people working in sweatshops or as in Bangladesh, they have sweatshops to turn out, to stitch and buttonhole garments yeah. where people work in miserable little cramped cubby holes, don't even have a toilet sometimes oh, and yeah. therefore they work at very low wages yeah. for very low cost and an American or a Canadian or a German who wants to have a spacious factory with lots of air and so many cubic feet per worker yeah. and uh, we've got to have access to a washroom yeah. and a lunchroom. They can't possibly compete. This talk about free trade is yeah. ridiculous when the economies and the expectations and living standards are so different. Good point. But the sneak rulers don't give a damn if you lose your factories, if you turn into hamburger flippers instead of operators of precision lathes. Yeah. Um, they don't give a damn. Good point. Volume and to hell with the Slow with the ecology. If the whole of Guatemala was one vast cotton plantation, um, coffee plantation and if a single bug 
like the ball weevil that destroyed the cotton fields. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the ball weevil, this uh, little bug, actually destroyed all the cotton crop of the southern USA once. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, they did. Now, suppose something similar happens in Guatemala or Nicaragua. Yeah. It'll, because it's a, not a variegated patchwork economy, it's just all coffee plantations, it'll just wipe it all out at once. Wow, yeah, that was happen. It's very important to have a small scale, a micro scale patchwork in every country, in every community. Divided, yeah. Yeah. So, we have to think about this new world order and its uh, insistence on free trade and uh, on a global scale. Uh, it certainly destroyed Argentina completely. Did it? Right. Argentina just became a beggared economy because oh. of what they call globalization. Oh. And America and Canada are going that way. And Donald Trump keeps saying, where are all your jobs gone? Yeah, gone to China. We are not making our own stuff. We'd be better off if we made our own stuff. Yeah. Because right now we are paying, for, America is paying for it in resources for sure. It's also paying for it in pretty paper and fraud. Printing US dollars and just selling dollars. Yeah. That won't last forever. So this is the white theater going on. And in this white theater, one of the chief goals of the snake rulers, the globalists, the masters, yeah. is to genocide white people totally. And another of their goals, of course, is to disarm the population so that they can completely impose secret police terror. They can control. Oh, it's already controlled in Britain and Australia. There's yeah. one bastion of freedom left. Just one, and that's the United States. Yeah, Canada's semi-controlled. They yeah. have the First Amendment, which gives them more freedom of speech than others, but they all have the Second Amendment, which means there's thousands and hundreds of thousands of guns. Millions of guns. <laughs> so if they send their secret police, and they're trying to shape the FBI into a secret police, yeah. and the Homeland Security into a secret police, into homes, they are likely to meet resistance. They want to disarm America. Yeah. And that again, Donald Trump stands against. Yeah. I will protect the Second Amendment. Is it the second debate? Second yeah. Second debate. Yeah. So this is not just another election. Um, yeah. Most elections are uh, of a sharing of the spoils between elites. Yeah. What about the battery situation? So fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, the sneak rulers asserted their dominance over society through various means. They con got control over the financial system. Then using that, they controlled the media. And that, of course, totally assured them of total control. Yeah. 40 but seconds left. You want to wind down this part? We might as well wind down and do, yeah, do continue in two. the next segment. Okay, we'll do part two now, OK? okay. This is not any old election. What happened in the past was, um, some 60 years ago, the sneak rulers established almost total dominance. They had a fair amount of power, share of, they had a big share of power before that. Yeah. But starting in the 1960s, they really got decisive power over yeah. the Western world yeah. and over the minds of Western people. Yeah. Uh, mind control was. Um, edged from say something like 30% to 70%. Yeah, I think so. So they control the minds of white people in all critical areas. And um, they, since they had the financial system, the chief levers of financial power, they could use those to totally acquire media power. Yeah. And uh, therefore control politicians. And the snake rulers found that um, the po it's very easy to get the politicians to bend to them and to serve them. Yeah. Now, politicians and the elite will always engage in corruption, they'll engage in patronage, they'll engage, above all, in getting a bigger share of wealth, yeah. of bigger houses, bigger cars. Yeah. Uh, for example, at one time, 
there was the corruption and power of Tammany Hall. That's what they called it. And there was a mayor of Chicago, I believe, and he was a white man dealing with a white society who said, it doesn't matter who votes and how they vote. The only thing that matters is that I count the votes. Oh, <laughs> well, he actually said that. Yeah. 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 I don't think it wow. was uh, Mayor Daly. I don't think it was him. <laughs> uh, well, the first Daly. I don't think it was him. But yeah. that's always been the case in every society. The um, elites and the politicians who rise to the top, they like to get a share, uh, uh, more than fair share of privilege and power. And they will be corrupt. Yeah. There's always a degree of corruption. Fortunately, white societies have controlled it, uh, have a lesser uh, quantum of that. Yeah. But there is that. Yeah. But then, once the sneak rulers asserted their dominance, the elites, the white elites, decided, gee, we'd better listen to them and serve them and obey them. Yeah. And they let us keep our power yeah. and privilege. Yeah. So gradually in the United States, the Democratic and Republican parties became parties that served the sneak rulers, got the patronage, and betrayed their peoples. Yeah. And this became more so of the Republican Party. It was uh, much more sneaky about it. As Americans from the 60s, 70s, 80s saw the unending flood of migrants, wherever, wherever they're from, Latinos or whatever, saw their own people vanishing from the television screens and alien faces coming up. Yeah. Um, the Republicans posed as the protector of white people and said, we are the conservatives, we will protect you, or we will... And they put up a good show, Yeah. but, but in effect, they betrayed them every time. Nothing happened to stop the bleeding of the borders. Nothing happened to stop the outflow of jobs as America got the industrialized. The Republicans were just another part of the establishment, they were yeah. at a lower level. Uh, the sneak rulers stayed on top yeah. with the real power and the, somewhere at the second or third rank came the senators and the congressmen, their lobbyists and the businessmen who benefited. And they said, why don't we benefit? If in fact they're letting in illegal workers, say a meatpacking plant like Tyson, I believe, or T-Y-S-O-N, yeah. Uh, one day someone investigated them, and I, I'm pretty sure it was Tyson, I could be wrong, and found that they had a lot of illegal workers working for cheap. Oh. They said, if this is the system, we have to compete with everyone else. If this is the playing field, well, we'll hire them, oh. and we'll make higher profits than the guy who doesn't hire illegal workers. Yeah, yeah. I know, we'll give them half wages, and, um, but that's the playing field. Yeah. And that's the playing field that was established. By design. So the fight between Democrats and Republicans uh, really was a f fight between two parties that said, no, I'll get more of the power if I get elected, and I'll get more of the wealth. Uh, no, I'll get, next time I'll let you have it. Um, but both of them served the sneak rulers. Yeah. In particular, when it came to something like the Israel lobby, it didn't matter who was in power. Um, and still doesn't matter. Republican or Democrat, they both serve them. Yeah. The eternal power, the paramount power, remains uh, stronger than ever, one would say. Like, like two arms from the same source. Yeah. Republican, Democrat. So you have the illusion of choice between the Republicans and Democrats. Illusion of choice. But for the Democrats and the Republicans, for the Senator Ryans and the Senator this or that, um, McCain, yeah. It was a question of, well, when, when you're in office, you'll get a little bit more. That's, that was all it was. Yeah. But this election is different. Yeah. In this election, we have not a party, but a movement. Yeah. Donald Trump leads a movement. He doesn't lead a party. So when, as we will see as we go on talking, the Republicans yeah. deserted him, yeah. it didn't matter. And the Republicans deserted him precisely for that reason. Yeah. That um, we'll, if Donald Trump is against this whole system, this new world order, yeah. but we are benefiting under the new world order. We are nicely tied to it. Of course. If he puts a serious dent in it, our, our present privilege and golf courses and golf course memberships is going to go down the tubes. They'd rather have Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> they'd rather let the 
sneak ruler system prevail. Let the right. new world order prevail because we are a privileged class Dreams. within it. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. So this is the white theater. And today, we really do stand at a crossroads, a historic divide. A populist movement is challenging the new world order and the right. system of privilege, the uh, corruption and privilege that has burgeoned under it. What might have been this much of natural corruption and privilege and rent-seeking, as they call it, has grown mm. to a huge amount under the sea. Yeah. Yeah. So, we stand really at a point where the future of the world, in a sense, will be decided on November the 8th, in about 21 yeah, days. It's the whole world, American election. The After world. that, there will be no more ballot box for change. White Americans in particular will never be able to vote to keep their land. Never. Uh, they will be outnumbered at the polling booths. I believe that present Americans, that includes American blacks and the Latinos inside America and the East Indians and the other people, the present Americans, they probably won't be able to keep the borders open. Uh, they keep the borders closed to keep the country yeah, closed, yeah. Um, at its present level of population. They probably won't be able to stop the globalized uh, the globalized economy. They will never be able to do manufacturing and inside the states again. Um, the United States will cease to function as an independent, as with any pretense of independence or autonomy. Yeah. It is just a province in the new world order. Oh, yeah, province. Just a province and probably an agricultural province. Yeah. So we stand at a really historic divide, but what happens afterwards? Well, there are two alternatives. Well, let's suppose that uh, Hillary Clinton wins, the, the face of the New World Order wins, and the New World Order now completely takes over America. Let's suppose. Well, it could be one of two paths. One, it'll slowly become a mongrelized, browner uh, state and become more third world, more corrupt, more lawless, with Mexican drug gangs terrorizing neighborhoods, people afraid to speak in case their throats get cut mm -hmm. by some drug lord, uh, judges being threatened and um, told lead or silver. In short, the United mm -hmm. States could be another Brazil gradually. Oh, yeah. It could descend to the level of Brazil, but peacefully. Um, it, something similar happened in India when the Aryans and the Dravidians, the black people, the white Aryans and the black people, yeah. slowly coalesced. Um, we have the India of today. Yeah. So that could happen, a slow slide, fairly peaceful, but with instability, with, const with every election, local election being more or less a fight, with corruption, with terror, people living in terror of gangs, but yeah. fairly peacefully as on the broad scale. Yeah. Or there could be something else. If Hillary Clinton wins, there could be uh, an awakening of various groups. The, there might be racial tensions. The blacks might start fighting the Latinos in the South. Yeah. Uh, the Latinos might say, oh, just get out of the way as we pour in in our millions. <laughs> and the whites yeah. could... Um, get together and say we are going to fight to at least keep some land for ourselves. So racial wars could break out. Whichever way, it's not going to be good. Yeah. No. So, it would be if the New World Order wins out in the form of Hillary Clinton becoming president, it could either descend into a Brazil-like situation or there could be violent wars which will lead to the split up of the United States and the formation of, finally, of ethnostates, a white ethnostate perhaps in the Northwest, yeah. a black ethnostate in the South which had to defend itself against the Latinos. Yeah. Uh, the Latinos have long talked about carving out a land called Aztlan, ah. A-Z-T-L-A-N. This is in Texas? In Texas, Arizona, really? New Mexico. They, they've openly announced it. Why? I didn't know that. They've been saying that openly, that we are 
carrying out the Reconquista. So it could be uh, either one of those two. Between Mexico. Honestly, I feel that the most likely one is a war between these groups and the formation of ethnostates and the total dissolution of the United States. Wow. Uh, that, I feel, is what's coming if Hillary Clinton wins. So that's what they want, you're saying? If Donald Trump wins, all that could happen, but in a, at a much more peaceful, slow pace. And uh, more likely, he will establish a state for present Americans, closed to all future immigration, legal or illegal. Yeah. So every American of political age today is pretty wide awake about this election. Yeah. Um, pretty wide awake in one way or the other, um, either feeling very strongly liberal or feeling very strongly woken up and uh, nationalistic. Yeah. Every American is aware that this is the most fateful and consequential one since the end of the Second World War. Perhaps they know that. Oh. They may be vague as to the details and only fuzzily aware of the central issue. They may be. They may be dumbed down and stupefied by the mass media and the social re regime. They may be choked mentally and verbally by the gag of political consciousness, no, of political correctness. Yeah. Consciousness would be good. <laughs> yeah. But no, they're not politically conscious, they're politically yeah, correct. Which is programmed, unconscious. Uh, well, they're gagged. Gagged. You're programmed, you're indoctrinated, but you're gagged by political correctness. But not on the Brian Rue show. <laughs> <laughs> or not gagged. A small yeah. patch of freedom yeah. in the howling wilderness. Small of fish in the big sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yet when Donald Trump says things to the effect that we must build a wall to secure our southern border, from and everyone adds the next few words from the hordes pouring in from Latin America and other yeah. parts of the world. Yeah. And he says things like, either we have a country or we don't. White Americans know. They know something. But what is it they know deep down in their hearts? They know that he's speaking to them and for them. Yeah. Uh, you know what Donald Trump is saying? But he's not saying it outright. He's a pro-white candidate. Yeah. It's, a, it's a measure of the extent to which Americans have been beaten down that he can't speak outright. Yeah. He can't say that white Americans need a voice. He never says the word white yeah, Americans. Can't say it, yeah. That is the measure to which white Americans have been disenfranchised and bludgeoned and intimidated and to the extent to which they're cowering. Good point. Donald Trump can't ever say that uh, white Americans need a voice. They need to, um, they have interests. Maybe they're in, say in danger. <laughs> yeah. He, what he does say in his speeches is that I also will look after the Latinos I yeah. will look at the problems of the black people, what have you got to lose, but he never does dare the to say cities. Uh, white Americans, he never dares to yeah. say that. But the white Americans know. Yeah. <laughs> they know. Well, if you look at his rallies. They're white, nearly white. Uh, or they're almost overwhelmingly white. Yeah. And what is it they know? They know that Donald Trump is in effect saying, he may not be saying it directly, but he's saying it in effect. The country that your forefathers discovered, colonized, conquered, and built into a great civilization for you is slipping away. Yeah. Now it is you, once a strong people, who are being colonized. If you want communities of your own, and to have the company of people with the same appearance and the same look, and the same soul, yeah. the same community so, of the heart, you need a country. Yeah. And that's what he's saying, and they know it. You need a nation state. Well, you can't have a nation state, but you can have a sovereign state in which you'll still have some land of your own, some say, and you'll still be a large proportion of the population. You yeah. need a nation state, but you can't have it. Too late. But you can have a sovereign state. Ah. And the sneak rule is, of course, <laughs> no sovereign states. We're going to smash these states. The USA, Canada, Sounds like communism. Germany. We're going to turn them into sort of hollow entities. Yeah. The it's borders so will be gone for goods, for people, for everything. Uh, the same bank will serve the whole, the whole of the, um, the great super state. Yeah. 
We need a name for that super state. Uh, I think of communism. <laughs> uh, I wonder if the sneak rulers have a name. Isn't it something from George Orwell's 1984, like Oceania? Yeah, uh, Oceania, Eurasia. Eurasia. What was Eurasia? it? Eurasia, Europa, Eurasia. Eurasia, East Asia. Like Oceania, right? And Oceania. So maybe the super state, the white super state, uh, formerly white super Ariana. state, will be called Oceania. Oceania. Yeah, maybe that's the name, huh? Could be. <laughs> So, Donald Trump is saying you need a piece of land that you can call your own. Land and soil and water which will be available to your children. Available to, the, to them for the simple reason that no one else can have that land and soil and water. Mexicans have the security of a country of their own. See? You don't. That's right. Mexicans have that security. They have a country oh, of their Mexicans. own. You white Americans don't. And that's what resonates in the hearts of white Americans even if he can't yeah, say it. he should be able to say it. So white Americans know that they're perilously close to becoming a powerless and despised minority in their yeah. own land. Yeah. This is their last chance to vote in a government that will retain some semblance of the country that their fathers and mothers and their grandfathers and grandmothers built. Yeah. Some schools and streets and towns that they can feel safe in and above all feel at home in. Yeah. Okay? Their own people. So it's now or never. Um, it's now or never, and everyone wondered why the debate of 9th October, the first debate, was so dramatic. Well, it's because this is no ordinary election. It's literally an existential fight. Yeah. Uh, for yes. white Americans, it's existential. For present Americans, it's existential. For the sneak rulers, for the New World Order, it's existential because this movement poses, as Donald Trump said, an existential threat to them. Yeah. So let's just be clear about one thing. Trump is no angel and he's no saint. He's beholden in many ways to the Zionist lobby. And it's very possible he'll enmesh the U.S. into Mid Middle Eastern wars. Yeah. He might yap forever about the nine, $19 trillion national debt of the U.S., yeah. but he won't stop the hemorrhaging of funds and materials to Israel. Yeah. And, you know, it's not just uh, so many billions of dollars going to Israel openly. There's other ways money goes there. Yeah, For example, um, the United States gave $1.3 billion a year in military aid to Egypt. Hmm. But that money is not for Egypt. It's a bribe to Egypt so that Egypt will blockade the Palestinians. Wow. And uh, which uh, Egypt has done many a time is blockaded the Palestinians, and which and still does actually. You mean from getting in and out? Yeah, from getting in and out. Oh, it'll arrest any Palestinian who's a resistance fighter. So that's where the money's going for. And it will. Yeah. I didn't know that. The 1.3 billion dollars that is military aid. There may be other money going to Egypt. The 1.3 billion dollars is to serve Israel and blockade the Palestinians wow. and act against them. I had no idea. Oh, well, every time, every so often an Egyptian general is hauled before a committee of Congress and they said, what's this? I see there are tunnels going between from, uh, from awesome. um, the Palestinian, from Gaza to Egypt or from the Palestinian land, other Palestinian lands into Egypt. We're going to cut off your money. And that general oh. says, sir. Sir, we will do our best. We are doing our best. Uh, don't cut off the money, please. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> and the same thing is the one billion dollars to Jordan. The yeah. security cooperation treaty between Jordan and Israel, and that one billion dollars in military aid will be cut off if Jordan doesn't. Wow, that's how they control. Serve Israel. So yeah. this money, this bribe, is not being paid by Israel. It's being paid by the American taxpayer. Wow. And you think Donald Trump Period. will stop that? I doubt it very much. So. He's not a total patriot, um, and maybe he can't be. There are many things on which Donald Trump is no uh, savior, but on the main issue of the very existence of the American state and of white Americans, the very survival of white Americans, there he's okay. He's yeah. the only person standing between he and his movement is the only thing standing between them and utter destruction. Wow. Yeah. But then, neither will Hillary Clinton stop the um, craven obeisance to Israel. 
She's oh, yeah. very much. Um, she'll be. She is probably more likely to have uh, wars. I think so. Involve American wars in the Middle East. Yeah. She was famously seen to push the decision to bomb Libya. Yeah. And when that bombing made the difference, and Gaddafi was thrown out of power and killed, they'll see an interesting shot, and it's available on YouTube, of Hillary Clinton saying, "We came, we saw." He died. Ha ha! She and laughs, and then she goes into that manic laughter, oh, uh, which indicates so sinister, a, yeah. a mental disease of some kind. Yeah, well, Most evil. that served the New World Order boys very much. Um, yeah, it served the fact that uh, Gaddafi wanted to get off the U.S. greenback and yeah. uh, trade in gold instead of depending on the U.S. greenback, and yeah, yeah the Federal Reserve and the U.S. dollar is still a big part of the New World Order. Oh, a big part. The sneak, part rulers, the sneak rulers have a global reach because of this US base that they have. Yeah. Um, Hillary Clinton will have more bombings, more drone I strikes so. um, Maybe Iran. than Donald Trump would have. And she's also interested in another thing that is very dangerous. Um, there's a big difference between her and Donald Trump. The, Masters of the New World Order want to bring Russia under their control. Uh, they're very anxious to bludgeon Russia. Yeah. And so they're, they're putting American bases all over Russia, all around Russia. They're trying to spend Russia into yeah. bankruptcy. Yeah, like lowering the war And price. then they can get in there yeah. and, get, and loot Russia, basically. Reduce it to starvation, as in the times of Yeltsin. Yeah. Uh, the sneak rulers seize the Russian economy and reduce the Russian people to poverty in the time of Boris Yeltsin. They want to do it again, so yeah. they're using American military power to push Russia into wasting money, uh, into wasting money yeah. and uh, uh, weakening its economy. Yeah. So Hillary Clinton is far worse, but in foreign policy, she's a totally dedicated servant of the sneak rulers. She is, yeah. And, but I'm saying Donald also might serve them in the matter of Middle East wars. Yeah, we don't know. It's always and, like... And uh, yeah. general militarism. He might do that. Yeah. So I'm not saying he's a perfect person. He wants a strong military, he said. Yeah, and that's, a, that's not good. It's when strong enough. Already, the Americans are throwing away huge resources in uh, minerals, metals, and labor, and brain power into this destructive military yeah. instead of putting food on the table. I know. So that's the part of Donald Trump uh, that's not good. Yeah. And yet, there's a stark difference between the two in this big matter. Clinton represents the globalists, the masters yeah. of the New World Order. Yeah. And that's in, um, been evident for a long time. No, oh, yeah, she's been doing it for a long time, but now it's in the open. Um, and the, you have to thank WikiLeaks for that. Yeah. And you have to thank WikiLeaks, you have to thank the internet and this whole new communications technology. Whereas the New World Order boys used to control television and yeah, through that control all the information, yeah. now their grip is weakening due to the internet. And the WikiLeaks is a part of that. What did they release about uh, Hillary? Wiki WikiLeaks? Well, what, the biggest thing they released about Hillary, they released quite a few things. Yeah. Well, the biggest thing they released was that, um, well, let's say one thing before I forget, that at one time, uh, for example, people used to get corruption money and they used to hide it in various ways. Yeah, yeah. Let's say a mafia gangster made $20 million. Yeah. And... Um, one way to hide it, as you saw in the um, movie Goodfellas, they'd arrange for, a, for him to go to a casino yeah. and win oh. a lot of money. Oh, I see. The casino There's would be money. part of it, and um, he'd win uh, this money. Explain where he got the money from. He explained where he got the money from, right. It's called laundering money. Wow. Or you want to give a bribe to a politician, but you can't. Uh, the best thing was for the politician to go to the casino yeah. and win. Thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, so I wanted uh, in a casino. I didn't take a bribe. Well, Hillary That's Clinton had certain ways. Apparently, at one time, she, 
when she was a lot younger, she put a thousand dollars into the futures market. Yeah. The futures market for cattle, I believe. I could oh. be wrong there. And she came out less than a year later with a hundred thousand dollars or more. Wow. Hundred times. The person who never the person who's never played the futures market suddenly comes out with a hundred thousand dollars. But they found another way to take bribes. Mm -hmm. and, um, this way is to make speeches. You yeah. go and make a speech to immensely powerful people who want you to do what they want you to do. Yeah. And you get paid two hundred thousand dollars. You get paid four hundred thousand dollars. And you say, Well, I earned that money making a speech. For Israel. Well, like going to the Israel lobby is one way, but yeah. here it was another way. Uh, she went to another audience. Yeah. She gave a speech to a bank that's incorporated in Brazil, something ITAU, yeah. I-T-A-U. You wonder, I don't know much about this bank, but it was a bank with international reach and connections. Yeah. And for making a speech, she got, it seems on average, she and Bill Clinton get between 200000 and $400,000. Yeah, I know. It's a brand new way of quid pro quo. I give you a bribe and you do what I want you to do. Yeah. So in the speech, the quid part of the quo part came out. She said, my dream is a hemispheric, is a dream of a total hemisphere. The Western hemisphere yeah. will be a zone of free trade, open trade and open borders. Oh gosh. Open borders. That's in effect the dissolution of the United States. Gone. Yeah, no country. And of course, if Canada comes into it, they're gone. Canada's gone too. Our right, battery's down to the last 12 seconds here. So we will we stop there. We'll stop here. Here I have a part three. Very good.